What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Bread to Build podcast, a project dedicated to sharing the stories of the people who build and those who help move construction forward. If you're liking the episodes with our awesome guests, all we ask you is to hit that little subscribe button. If you're a returning listener, thanks for coming back. It would mean the world to us to drop a little review. My name is Brett Gowen. I'm the founder of Hammer and Builders of Insta. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Matt Pinella. We have been shooting out some stickers, some hats, all kinds of good stuff. What's going on, guys? It's Matt Pinella. If you want any of that good stuff, reach out on Instagram and we'll get you taken care of. Today, we've got a fun one. We're going to talk business and quite a bit more. So we got one hell of a guy on the show today, someone that I've known for a few years now. Finally met him at uh, the International Builder Show. His hair is just as great in person. I want to touch Uh, it. (laughs) I absolutely love what you're doing, Sean. Just uh, everything that you're doing with the businesses and the industry. Uh, But yeah, today we got Sean Van Dyke on the podcast, probably long overdue, but we're talking all things profit and building a successful business. If you don't already know him, Sean is a nerd and a systems guy at heart. He's uh, previously an engineer and a contractor turned speaker and construction business coach. And one thing that I do want to tell you guys listening today, before we dive in, we are offering a 50% off consultation with Sean. This is a one hour consultation to gain tactical advice to solve the problems that are standing in your way today. It is a $500 value for about 250 bucks but you do have to have some sort of skin in the game. Um, If you're interested in that and you're serious about it, go to the description in the podcast below, click on the link there. We will have it Um, from there. You'll share where you're at in business, the challenges that you're facing and one business will, we will pick to move forward with a consultation with Sean. So definitely take advantage of that opportunity. If you're serious about growth, with that being said, Sean, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me here. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for making time for me. And uh, yeah, excited to to get to finally meet with you guys. Been been like you said, uh, Breck. We met several years ago at IBS. Matt, I think this is probably the first time we've talked in person. I know we swapped some messages, but it definitely uh, is. But yeah, it's 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 just fun to be in the cool kids group, man. There we go. I didn't know we were <laughs> there. How but... we feel about you, Sean? Yeah, well, you guys are you guys are young and hip. I'm 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 old and crotchety, so I, I feel like I you know I got invited into what the cool kids are doing now. So great well, to be here, guys. I think with your jujitsu skills, you probably still kick my ass. So um, you're in. Yeah, I w- maybe. Yeah, I will say maybe. That. I don't know. I don't know. Youth, youth, uh, youth has a lot to do with it, and uh, I can I get beat up by plenty of younger guys that are less skilled, uh, but still are still flexible and very strong. So well, I don't take that for granted. Breck works out quite a bit, so I'll just tag him in. Yeah, exactly. I took two weeks off. I was feeling a little slim last couple of days, but uh, we're getting back into it. So I think uh, Sean could kick the the hell out of a little feather right now. Awesome, Sean. Uh, I'm excited to jump in. Uh, Before we get uh, too much into it, uh, I think a lot of people know who you are, but just for the people who don't, let's set the stage for the listeners. Give us a rundown of who you are, what you do, and then we'll, uh, we'll dive in. Yeah, like you had said before, I'm a nerd for systems. That comes from uh, probably, I guess it's been 20 plus years ago. Now I got a couple of degrees in engineering, started out in civil engineering and got my master's in structural engineering. That put me down the engineering path for several years. And I know a lot of your listeners out there are rolling their eyes because they're contractors and we all you know, have certain thoughts about engineers and I make fun of them all the time because I used to be one. So uh, after realizing that uh, I didn't know how to build anything. I wanted to get into construction. I knew how to design stuff and I knew how to read plans, but I didn't really know how to build anything. So worked for some commercial contractors on the, on the project management side of things. And that just led me uh, down the path of eventually becoming a residential contractor. I had a small remodeling company for several years. Also in, in between there, started start a real estate development company and uh, and then eventually found myself as an executive of a high end trim and millwork company here. I'm here in Knoxville, Tennessee, did that for a few years and got this crazy idea that uh, the systems that I had been uh, that I've been building in my own business and the other businesses that I, that I helped operate. I thought, I think I might be able to help other construction businesses with this stuff. So I left my job as a, uh, as a COO of the trim and millwork company and started, started doing this. I had no idea what I, you know, even really what business coaching was, but I, 
had a bunch of systems that I knew that worked. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try to do this uh, as part of that too, just traveling around to industry events. And we've been there and we've seen them all. And I saw, man, there's a huge opportunity to actually be a speaker that's engaging with people instead of reading 75 bullet points off of a PowerPoint presentation that was done <laughs> in 1985 with Microsoft yep. Paint. And, and I was just like, <laughs> I think I might be able to add something uh, here. So I started speaking and, and speaking about systems and trying to take, trying to make the nerdy system side of business engaging, entertaining, and actionable. Um, and did that for a few years and continued to do that. And then along the way, wrote wrote a couple of books, Profit First for Contractors and the Paperwork Punch List. And yeah, and then just like every other entrepreneur, uh, the day to day is just trying to figure out. Uh, how to how to grow this business, this coaching business with multiple you know income streams and and building an audience and delivering value and uh, trying to trying to help as many contractors make as we say a kind of our tagline is to make more money, streamline their business, and get their lives back. Mm -hmm. So I I want to I want to say something really quick because there's so many coaches and so many different people that can help you grow your business and stuff. And what I've seen is. I don't think any of them have the experience that you do. And that's what I love is that you've bounced around to so many different places. You've been in this industry in so many different ways that you actually have the knowledge. So many times it's like, we can help you 10 X your business, but it's like, what, what do you have? How, how are you credible enough to help do that? You actually have the skin in the game to say, this is what you need to do. This is how it needs to be done. And I, I love that about you. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. One, one thing that I have really honed in on, uh, is, and this may sound a, a little bit weird, but I just, I just wanted to stay in my lane. I know that I, I can offer a lot of value to construction companies, uh, just because I've, I've been there. I've done that, uh, not only from the, the commercial side and real estate side, but also a small residential, uh, company. And I just know the lingo and I know how your foreman thinks. And I know how the, I know how the crews interact because it used to be my job to, to make sure we were, I was helping those guys make money. And, and I learned very, very early on, uh, you know, I used to wear the tools. I've built a few projects myself. And, and then when you get around professional tradespeople, you realize, or I realized how much I suck at, at doing trades. I, I'm not <laughs> skilled. And, but I realized that they don't want to be in front of a computer. They don't want to look at data. Yeah. They don't want to, right? So there's value there to, to offer. Uh, and so when I, I try to bring that into my coaching business, we get we get contacted by a lot of other uh, businesses outside of, outside of construction. And we don't work with any of them because I tell them, I'm like, listen, I can't walk into your, even an architecture firm. Uh, we've had interior designers reach out to us and, you know, other things in and around the construction industry. And I'm like, I can probably help you with some general business stuff overall, but like, we're, I, I don't know that, but what I could do, like Matt, I could, I could probably come out to the field and watch how your guys interact and see where the uh, efficiencies are, the inefficiencies are, and some of the systems that might be, you know, might be lacking and yeah. kind of know how to talk to your lead guys. Cause what are they struggling with? And the things that uh, things that, you know, I know what Matt says, you guys aren't picking up on that uh, just because that's what I did. Uh, so I, I always just say as a business coach, I'm not one of these guys that are trying to serve everybody. Uh, we're, I'm very specific. I just want to stay in my, stay in my lane. There's plenty of business coaches out there in construction. They focus on sales and marketing. And, and we've, we've heard a lot of people talk about, Oh, I got this business coach, but it really wasn't deep on the system side. It was it was good for what it was general business. Yeah, and I said, yeah, hey, general business, you want to make money, you need to spend less than you bring in. Like, yeah, but they couldn't tell us exactly how we do that day to day. And I'm like, that's where we say we can, and because that's all we do. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do your marketing. I'm gonna tell you what what good marketing is. Mm -hmm. But like, you need to hire a coach or a consultant to do specific, you know, specific marketing. But what we do is help you build systems so that when you get the marketing, it flows to operations, it flows to everything else. So I just try to say like, hey, we just stay in our lane construction companies. That's all we consult. That's all we coach because that's all I know. And I feel like that can deliver more value there than trying to be, be 
the the guru to everybody. Exactly. The, the cure all for businesses. We'll make you money regardless of what you do. But that's awesome. Sean, um, I, can I just, I want, I want to chime in really quick because I think right. there's some people that are, might be listening to this and anytime people in construction start thinking about systems and data, uh, I think a wall might go up and they're like, wow, this is right over my head. Maybe it's just break it down for us a little bit, Sean. Like how do you define systems and how should construction companies be thinking about it? Yeah. So the way that we define systems is systems is a series of steps that leads to an outcome. That's it. And no matter what the business is, uh, you have systems in your business. Now, they may not be good. Uh, they may not be scalable, repeatable. And, they, and the other thing we say about systems, so systems is a, uh, a, a series of steps that lead to an outcome, dot, dot, dot. And, it, and if it's not written down, it doesn't mm -hmm. count, right? So it's that, it's that whole thing. When, when you aren't in your business doing that thing, can someone come in and take a look when I, you know, see what the system is because it's because it's documented. So a lot of construction business owners say, oh, we need systems. And they they think about they think about all of the stuff in the office, right? The paperwork side of it. And so that's certainly a, a lot of it. But like the system of like, how do we get our guys uh, to show up on a job site, knowing what the scope of work is and what the end game is for today or this week. Mm -hmm. Like this, that system exists and it usually is the owner showing up, barking orders, texting over the weekend and all like that's a system. It's just mm -hmm. not a good one. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you have systems because those things are still getting done. We want to take what's already happening in your business and streamline that and get it repeatable and maybe scalable uh, so that it doesn't all fall, you know, all doesn't depend on you. And we're just big believers. There's a system for everything in your business, everything. So you're not even talking like a high level, like really diving into numbers of people. You're talking like basics as well, like communication from owner to employees and things like that. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the most, and I would say this all the time, the most basic system, the time card system. Yeah. Hey, how do your guys clock in and clock out? And how do you know what tasks they're working on? Yeah. Well, they just show up and we pay them for eight hours a day and we they get a paycheck every week or every two weeks or whatever. It's like, that's a system. Okay. Yeah. There, there's probably a couple of systems there, but like, if you want to know this project, and we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, uh, before we started recording is like, you know, placing that concrete, how many man hours did we have estimated into it? And you're going to, you're going to place the concrete and then the guys are going to go work on something else. You're going to two or three tasks that day. Well, when they're placing the concrete, we need to know, well, that's billing code 101. And then when we're done with concrete, we're going to go do something else. That's billing code 405. And then somebody has got to go run and go get some more materials. That's kind of a general project admin. Yep. That's billing code 972 or whatever. Like that's a system. And you put that on your time card and somebody takes that time card that doesn't, they don't need to know anything about construction. All they know is billing codes for this job get accounted for here. And yeah. this employee gets paid the 42 and a half hours they worked and it's just a system. So it's, yeah, it's a lot of people think systems, they think the number crunching and yeah. profit and loss and all of that stuff. And I'm like, how you pay your guys and your employees, there's a system there. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. And I've seen it personally is like, we we spent way too much time on project A, but it's like really project B and C got done as well. And you're accounting for that in project A, therefore you're showing a loss. Sure. It was profitable, but you don't think so. And I think like, like you're saying, documenting everything and making it to where it's four hours here, three hours there, one hour for this and really breaking it down that way. Um, that's probably really helpful. I'm curious to know, we, we need to talk after this because I need, I need to see what we could do about that. that that's really, that's Matt signed up for the Dude, Yeah, Matt, Matt's going to be the first one that signs up for the, yeah. for the console. I'll rig this go. stuff. I'll get the console. Yeah, it's, it's going to be rigged. It's going to be rigged. Oh, yeah, that's... Matt wins, then we're cheating. Yeah, Matt wins. <laughs> no, I, I think that's that's awesome. And that's something that personally I think I can improve on quite a bit because I'll, I'll be the first one to admit there's days where it's like we, we work eight to nine hours and it's on three different job sites, but that'll get paid out from one project, not all three of them. So then it's like, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, we look like we're losing money on project A, but really project B and C contributed to that as well. 
Yeah. So that, that's interesting. I, I need to pick your brain on that more. I wanted to talk about something though. Um, it's something that you've mentioned quite a bit and that's the craftsman cycle. Um, can you give us a breakdown on what this is and what it means? Yeah. So when I, when I wrote the book, uh, profit first for contractors, uh, when I was ideating about like, how do I, how do I convince construction business owners that, that this is a system that works and, and, and to keep it very simple. And that's for people that are familiar with it, that have gone through it. If you're not familiar with it, it, the reason it's so effective and say this all the time is because of its simplicity. Uh, so I knew that a way before I got into the number crunching part of the of the system, I had to make sure that contractors were on on board. And so I kind of thought about like, what is what's the process? And I just went back to my own my own business and thinking about like, what were this? What were the struggles that I was having in this craftsman cycle? I didn't hadn't given it a name yet, but I said, here, here it is in a nutshell. When you start out, uh, you know, you you start your business and you think I'll just charge a little bit more than what I was making as an, an employee or whatever. And I'll, you know, I'll be in the money or whatever. And you don't have systems. and It's okay. So you go and price work. That's the first phase of the cycle. And then you go, you know, and people, because you don't know how to price, you don't, you haven't been hit with tax bills and workers comp and delays <laughs> and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. You just maybe are charging twice your hourly rate that you're getting paid as an employee or whatever. So you think that you're making money and then you go out and you, so you price the work. And I would say, and you probably do really great work. And I always say, if you do really high quality work, but you don't charge enough for it, you're going to get a ton of work. And, but mm. you think you're making money. So that's the first, first phase is pricing work and you're guessing. Then, because you probably aren't charging enough, you'll, you'll get a bunch of work. That's phase number two. We got a bunch of work and then you think, this is great. Money is flowing in. It's more money than I've ever seen. I am successful. We are off to the races. This is going to be great. Then the third phase kicks in because eventually if you price work and you get work, which is un, you know underpriced, then you start producing work that's when the money leaves. And then you realize I'm out of money, but I got more project left. Holy crap. I need to go get more work. And so you get into the fourth phase, which is find work. I'm going to scramble around, find work. And so you talk to people, you know, whatever it is to find work. And then because you're so locked in on getting these other jobs that you don't have any more money on, you just fall right back into pricing work. Oh, good. We got the next project. Somebody needs something. I found it. Now the next step is, oh, they need a price. Uh, I, I don't have time to develop systems. I, don't, I haven't done job costing. Mm -hmm. I haven't analyzed my numbers. And mm -hmm. I really don't know the difference between margin and markup anyway, but everybody tells me 20%. That's good, which is garbage. So you go price more work and then you, the cycle repeats. Price work, get work, produce work, find work, price work, get work, produce work, find work. And okay. It's a vicious cycle and it just keeps you, it, it always keeps you trapped on focusing on the urgent things in your business instead of the important things mm. like sales systems and understanding your numbers and having a properly organized profit and loss statement so that you can see, you know, where, where the profit is or where it's not. So are you, you saying, cause I've, I've heard and used the term robbing Peter to pay Paul for years now. Are you saying that's ultimately what these people are doing is they get the work, they do the work, but they're not profitable. Therefore, they need more work in order to cover the work that they're not finished with yet. And then the cycle repeats. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. And some people get convinced that's just the way it is. And some people it also gets masked because and that's I think what we're experiencing now with a lot of the demand. I've seen a lot of contractors that are like, Sean, we've doubled in size. And I'm like, what they mean is there's more money coming in, but there there's less money at the bottom, right? And so it's it can be masked by like, yeah, we've got a constant cat money's coming in, and you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, but we're in such a high demand, and every contractor's busy, so the bank account never gets low enough because you got new stuff coming in, but all it takes is you have one project go south. You have a little bit of a blip in the pipeline. Uh, we're going to, you know, I know that you guys were talking about uh, in the last podcast uh, with the recession and that kind of stuff. It's those little downturns where now the supply is cut off even for a week, a month, 
whatever mm-hmm. it is, there's a dip. And then it's just like, oh, we don't, we didn't realize we were stealing from this job. We were just always looking at the money come in and we we're able to pay yeah. our bills. And a lot of those business owners are actually able to pay themselves. They're able to pull money out, but they're pulling it from future cash, meaning we got deposits and things coming in. And when we pull, when we pull it out, we don't realize if that money stops, the, the, the money that I'm taking now is actually from that future money. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's the way that a lot of people think. I, I like what you said in the beginning there as well, because I, I know a family friend of ours um, recently had his best lead quit on him to become a contractor himself. And like you're saying, it, it was spot on. He, he talked to me like, I don't know, a couple months after he quit. And he's telling me, he's like, I'm busier than I've ever been. We're doing all sorts of things. We're booked for months. And I was like, just curious, like, how are you, how are you set up? What are you doing? He's like, I'm just charging a flat rate time and material. And I know where we're at. And we, we run a handful of guys and it's not cheap. And I was like, just curious, where are your numbers at? He's like, right now I'm booked out solid 55 bucks an hour. And I'm like, you are undercutting the hell out of everybody in this yeah. industry right now. But he's booked out solid. And all he sees is, I was making mm-hmm. 35 as a lead. Now I'm making 55 as a contractor. This is gold. Like I, I just hit big, but really it's so far from the truth. Yeah. And then the tax man comes and they go, Oh, holy crap. Like as an employee, I was getting paid $35 an hour. I was only seeing $28 an hour in my paycheck because of all of the, you know, the FICA and the, you know, social security, and all those letters that no one really know, but they yeah. you get used to it. Right. But now I'm making 55 and guess what? That 55, the government's not taking anything out as you get it. So yep. you're spending End of that the year 55 and guess what? You're not only having to pay tax on, on that, but also the, the United States of America says, congratulations, you're self-employed. We give you a self-employment tax and, and people get hit with this and they realize, I don't have any money. And yep. so they go and raise the rates or they just go get more work or they don't, you know, they just don't know. And I, you know, like you said, they, they, it feels like they're making so much because that first wave of cash has come in and there's a cycle of business. There's ups and downs, there's seasonality, there's things that happen in the market. Um, but the tax man is coming every year and it usually just, it, and it can be masked. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have that much to pay in taxes. Uh, we've got money. I need to go pay that during an uptime when a bunch of money's coming in. But then when start, things start to s- slow down, you can't go to the IRS and be like, well, things are really slow right now. Let me uh, let me get back to you on that. That's that's not how it works. So with that being said, how can someone break this cycle? What does that look like? Do you have to just completely clean slate and start over? What I'm sure you deal with this quite a bit with people. How do you get out of this? Well, that. When when we run through clients through their numbers and and it's interesting when they when they come in it, because we'll 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 start with the numbers. I always say the math of your business is going to tell me the story that I need to see. Like I know you've got problems and it's been very stressful and there's a bunch of other and we talked about this a little bit before about just kind of the mindset, right? Hey, we'll get to the mindset stuff, but let's look at the math. And my job as a business coach, I always say this is like, you may disagree with my tactics or my strategies. And we can, there's always a little bit of figuring out like what the the client, what, you know, how they absorb information, how they learn and that kind of stuff. But one thing you can't argue with me on is the math because yeah. I didn't invent it. God did. And it's not changing it. So let's get really clear the math of your business and, and what the profit and loss uh, looks like and what the balance sheet looks like, because it's just numbers. And I would say the math of your business is actually very simple. So a lot of contractors that may be listening to this and think that the finances, uh, there's a there's a difference. The, the finances, the financial reports can be confusing, but underneath all of that is the math of your business. And if you can read a tape measure and add fractions in your head, you already know more advanced math is required to do the math of your business. You just don't know where to look for it, right? So we break we break down the math and say, hey, when you pay yourself, for example, as through owner's draws, you might, you might pay yourself $100,000 a year or whatever. That's great. But where does the money come from? And when we look at the profit and loss, when, and this, this is just a, a financial thing, uh, you say, oh, there, we, we made $80,000 in net profit. That's what's at the bottom of the profit and loss statement. 
But when you paid yourself a hundred thousand dollars, that didn't show up in you know in the profit and loss statement. Where did that money come from? So you're actually negative twenty, and that's why they say, "Well, Sean, I'm paying myself. I've got a pretty good living, but I never understand like why don't we have any money?" It's because you're not charging enough for the work or you're not producing the work in the way that you estimated it or you're there's other things where the money's just you know it, it's just going out of the going out of the business so i always start with we got to get the the finances the numbers and where your business needs to be on the mass side that's the foundation of everything and there's always a gap there's like when we run through the numbers hey you need to charge 20 percent more 30% more. That's how the math will work out. It's right there. And then they'll say, well, we can't do that. Our clients don't want to pay our prices now. And you're saying, I got to be 20%, 25% more. And I said, hey, the good news is that's simple. We just go get you better clients. And they're like, wait a minute. Well, how do we get better clients? Then we get into, okay, this is going to be the hard part. You're going to start charging your clients for estimates. You're going to start saying no. You're going to develop a menu of products and services that you say, hey, here's what we do. And we talked about this before. Here's what we do. Yeah, we used to do that. We figured out we can't make any money at that. That's not on our menu anymore. Here's exactly why you need to hire us. Yeah, we're awesome at this. We're going to deliver a great experience. And yeah, you're going to pay more. Oh, the guy, you know, somebody else is 20% cheaper. You can say, yeah, used to be that guy. That guy ain't making any money. He's going to be out of business. He's charging $55 an hour and he's going to get, when he gets hit with a tax bill in a year and a half, he'll be out of business. We're going to be in, we're going to be in business. That's why we want, that's why we're going to charge you what we need to charge you. And you can have confidence saying like, man, I don't need to work for free anymore. Yeah. So you're, you're selling you value actually, at that point. Yeah. Then you could actually service your clients because you're yeah. not in business. <laughs> and you're not broke. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sean, I want to dive in. Maybe we'll take one step back because I do want to get into some of the profit stuff and the revenue and everything. But obviously, it's clear to me that the larger the business grows, clearly the more aggressive the craftsman cycle gets. If someone were to listen to this podcast episode right now and they're thinking, well, Sean, I don't got 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 guys. I'm not in the cycle. When does that start to engage? You mean when, when they, when they like if, if you're have small real- enough, they might not even have the realization that they're in that cycle. So if they're oh, let's yeah, just I- say they're less than five, they're one, two, three, four, five. I don't know six. You see it more than I do. How do you diagnose like when you're actually in that cycle? I think that's pretty hard to tell if you don't have like chaos and a bunch of fires with 10, 15, 20 people running around, and it's very obvious to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's some basic some some basic questions you can ask yourself is um do you get paid for professional services that's that's a big thing meaning like do you run around and give away professional consulting advice for free which is most people call an estimate that's a good indication that you're in the craftsman cycle uh be, because now you might get some businesses you know, can do free estimates, but what they actually do is they give a free, I'm not against free estimates. It's just customers think you got to come out here. I don't have plans. I don't know anything. I need you to come and look at it. They're asking for professional experience, professional advice. You can get paid for that. Now they could call you up and say, Hey, Matt, we want to put an addition on our house. Hey, tell me, you know, how big is the house? What neighborhoods it in? What are you guys thinking? Oh, great. Yeah. In general, that's going to cost uh, anywhere between 150 to 175. Oh, great! Will you come out here and take a look at it and answer all of my questions and write me something up? Uh, sure, we get paid 500 dollars or 1,000 dollars or whatever. Oh, am I not going to get an estimate? No, let's back it up. I just gave you an estimate. That thing that you described that you need a lot of help with in professional services, I told you is 150 to 175. That's the estimate. And I gave it to you and I didn't charge you anything for it. So they're getting some clarity on that. But if you're giving away all of that time, then who pays for that, right? It, yeah. You're giving that time you away. Do. Another thing is, is if you can't step away from your business uh, without it totally falling apart, you're probably in the craftsman cycle. If everything, if everything depends on you. Um, and if you're not, if you don't have a system for job costing, and again, it's one of these things... 
a lot of owner operators, especially like you, you're out in the field doing the work because that's what you're great at. You do not want to be in front of the computer and, and crunching numbers, but like, it's just the basic business. We, we, we gave a price for something based on a scope of work time, materials, all of the things that go into it. Now we're out there performing it. We got to check and make sure, are we, the, the labor hours that we had estimated, is that what we actually spent? And when you say, oh my gosh, no, we spent so much more time, you got to ask yourself why. It could be, we just estimated it wrong. We guessed, but now we know. Or it could be something happened out in the field that it wasn't clear from the scope of work that we were going to encounter that. Either way, that becomes another data point in the database and you start building up this, this menu and the ability to actually be able to give free estimates over the phone or very quickly with confidence. And it actually becomes very accurate. But if you don't have an estimating system comparing uh, actuals uh, to estimated, that's going to keep you trapped there too. And a lot of guys are listening going, well, I don't, I don't have a sales system. I don't have you know, an estimating system, maybe I'm trapped. And then you think how much, here's the other thing is, is for business owners, especially how much time does it require for you to run your business week to week and get, get real honest with yourself, 60, 70 hours, then divide that by how much you paid yourself. And you'll find that hourly rate is pretty low. So I, I went through something like this not too long ago where we were pricing projects per square feet, which has been like a all right basis to go off of in the beginning. But what it came down to and what I've ultimately switched to is, all right, we've got this square footage price. We know that that's where competitors should be at, but let's break it down for our business and see if it's profitable for us. So I've got a weekly number that I've got. And if we can't pull that project off with wiggle room at the end and X amount of weeks, it's not going to be profitable. So whether you think like, and I've had multiple projects where I'm like, I know where we need to be at as far as price goes, but it doesn't make sense for our business. We're not going to be able to do it in time. We're going to lose money. It just doesn't make sense. But on that subject, that's probably one of the most frequent questions I get asked by people that are new to wanting to become a contractor is, Matt, how, how much per square foot for this? And I, I just told somebody on Instagram, like I think it was last night, they asked me, Matt, I, I know the price for flat work is X amount. What's the square footage price for foundations? And I gave him a good example. We have one foundation that we did that was fairly simple, 900 square feet, and it was 22,000. And then there's another one that's 800 square feet, and it's close to 180,000. And it's due to different variables in construction, such as a hillside or engineering, soils reports, so on that every project is different and a square footage price doesn't work across the board in order to run a successful business. So uh, it's been a learning curve for me as well. And I think you're spot on with all that is like dissecting it further than face value of a square footage price and really going into, is this going to be profitable for us? Because they might think it is, but for us, it just simply doesn't make sense. Yeah. And what you're describing there, the square footage price it, it, and everybody's experienced this from the client side too, right? They, they send you a set of plans. They talk about, hey, what do you, what's your square footage price? And I, this was always my response after making the mistake. I didn't figure this out because I was smart. I made this mistake. And every time I got the square footage price wrong, I was like, I got to quit saying square footage numbers yep. until I either develop my own square footage number or whatever. Um, I, this is, and this will hit some people wrong. So uh, this is just what I did is when customers would, if they brought up the square footage price, I just say, oh, well, that's not how we put your project together. But tell you what, um, what we do is develop a detailed scope of work and price your project for the, the, the level of quality and the specs and, and whatever the project is. We'll give you a price for that and you can divide it by whatever, whatever square footage you want. If you need us to help you with that math, just let us know. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, think about it. Another, and I heard a contractor one year describe this at uh, at IBS, talking about square footage. Square footage is what they use from their database because they developed their own square footages because it does make it fast and accurate. Yeah. But if like, hey, if I'm calling up Matt and be like, hey, Matt, what's your square footage price on on framing or lineal foot, whatever that thing yeah. is. 
and you say, well, this is what, you know, we, I don't know, whatever, you know, $85 a square feet. Okay, great. I'm new. I don't have any other information. I'm going to use that. And then I'm going to add to that and say, well, what if something's going to go wrong? Maybe I add another five or 10%, but I don't know if that $85 an hour uh, or sorry, $85 a square foot is going to be accurate. So what I need to do is track everything that goes into making that square foot and later say, how did, it, how did that number show up? How did that work out? And be like, oh, we were at like 92 a square foot now that we actually do it. So my number now either needs to be 92 or I call Matt back and be like, man, I couldn't hit this number. Like, what else are you doing? And then you say, oh, well, what that thing that you were talking about, dude, you had some elevation changes. Every time we do an elevation change, it's a $500. Like you take your square foot, yeah. you count the corners, you count the, and you, you know, this stuff in your head, right? And that the new guys that are coming out, they're just like, what's the square footage price? What well, they call their plumber. Hey, what's the price per fixture? Or what's your square footage or whatever? That's because they've qualified. That's what they need to make. You've got to qualify your own square footage number, but never advertise that to a customer. Oh, no. They will. Here's the other thing is, and what this builder said at, at, at IBS was, yeah, we'll, we build the estimate based on square footage prices, but man, kitchen or a bathroom, that square footage price is, you know, 10 times the amount of a hallway. Yep. Like when an, an owner asks, what's your square footage price? What are we talking about? The most expensive, smallest area in the house. That's probably $600 a square feet. Yeah. Or are we talking air? And then he even said, he goes, I always like to ask people what the square footage of the yard is. Cause they're like, and they don't know. Right. And be like, well, when we're done, I mean, you, you want grass. What's the square footage of the driveway? Like, the, they're just talking about the house. Then are you talking about condition, unconditioned space, decks? The, everything has a square footage. Absolutely. What are you talking about, right? So it's a it's really a nonsensical question, but you get it all the time from homeowners. That's why I just say, hey, we don't price your job that way. Now we know that we we may have developed our database and it's accurate and it's fast to produce the estimate, but estimating the job is different from pricing the job. Estimating is step one. Doing the doing the takeoffs, counting the doors and windows, and putting all the square footage together. That's the estimate part. Now we got to price it because this three thousand square foot house with access all the way around, pretty straightforward. That other three thousand square foot house that's exactly the same. We can't even get a piece of equipment in there. The HOA is going to require us to do all of this other stuff, and that homeowner is a jerk. Guess what? your price of the job is different because of all of these other factors. So I say you, you estimate the job, then you price that job. And then the third step is you got to get outside of that and say, what's going to go wrong? What haven't I thought of? And that third step is we call it the check yourself. You got to reverse engineer your price so that real, you know, that you, you know, that reality is going to reality is going to happen. You do that enough. And we're, when I say enough, like six months, eight months, if you commit to that, then you're going to start to build up a database and you can estimate very accurately because you will have developed some internal square foot prices and lineal foot prices. And you'll be able to talk with more confidence because you've seen that $85 square foot price grow to 95 and you know exactly every point where it went from 85 to 87 to 92 to 95. And so when someone says, hey, what's your square footage price? You can run, you're like, well, it's about a thousand square feet here. It's 95 to 100, it's 95,000 to 125,000. You've used the square footage price, but you're not going to tell them that. I think all too often people just hope that that number is good across the board. And then, like, you go on, I know Home Advisor is big on pushing this, but they've got like this calculator where you can put in, I want X amount of this. And it tells you, all right, the price should be this. And it's like, this is giving these homeowners a false sense of what it really should cost. And it, it, it doesn't work out. I, I'm glad to hear that what I'm doing is almost on the right track because that's kind of what I've done over time. I've, we've lost a lot of money. I'll be the first one to say that as well. But like it came with learning lessons and that was super helpful in business because I now know not to do this, this, and this um, or to factor in things differently. Those variables like you're talking about you could have a simple slab on grade and it's super easy to do, but then you've got this stepped foundation on a hillside that's going to take way too much time. 
So those variables, the square footage works to get like a, a base number, but then everything from there up. That's um, right. That's changes yeah, with you, those variables. You you and you can get to the base number and you should get to the base number very, very quickly. Yeah. But it is a baseline. Then you have to step out. And this the only way this comes is through experience. Yeah. So that young guy that's calling you up and says, Hey, hey, Matt, what's your square footage price on this? And you're like, Yeah, it's $85 a square foot. He's gonna go back and be like, This other guy said it was $70 a square foot. I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to use that because I want to get the job, right? I'm yeah. pricing the job. I'm guessing, right? And here's the thing that, and it's and it's a, and it's a good thing, but it just takes the, these younger guys in business. You've got to develop some patience with this. Like somebody calling you up, Matt, with your experience has to realize like they're, they're, they're talking to like a chess master. And it, the reason I bring this up, I'm reading, reading a really good book right now called Peak. Um, and it's about how the mind uh, works and how we memorize things. When you look at a job, Matt, you're looking at it with all of your years of experience. You know, let's just take a you know a concrete pour or whatever. Yeah. You don't even realize you're calculating all of the different things that you know are going to increase the price in that, and so you can come up with. It. And it's almost subconscious, right? The the guys without experience don't see those things, uh, and so they don't trust your number or they think no it can be it can be done cheaper than that but then after years of experience you're like oh nothing straightforward there's all these little things that caught that are going to cost me money um, or i'm going to lose money so i've got to add that back in there and so my message to the young guys starting out and the young gal starting out is like just trust <laughs> just trust the guys when the when you think that the price is too high just go with their number yeah they're right you're wrong and develop some patience and then break it down and track everything. I like that. This, this is going to kind of dive off into story time a bit, but it kind of falls yeah. in line with something you said quite a bit. Um, when I was 16, I was just dropped out of high school. Um, I was writing proposals for a neighbor of mine who was a framing subcontractor because he didn't know how to use a Word doc. Um, and I, <laughs> I, I, it's a funny story. I made a lot like of money it. from him, but... I'd, I'd go over there and I'd talk to him. And I remember this was like the first step into like business for me um, because I was framing at the time as well. And I'm sitting there with this guy. He's, you know, having a beer or two and I'm hearing 400,000. And we'd sit there for a minute. Nope, 450,000. And I'm like, that's $50,000 freaking higher. Where are you going? You know what? 375. And I'm like, is that your final answer? Yep, we'll go with that one. I'm like, so we just went up 50 and then down 75. This is great. But the, the whole point of this is like, most contractors don't understand the actual business side of their building. They understand the trade that they specialize in. Why is this such a common thing? Do, like, why, why is this almost every contractor? Yeah, I, I think, and, and this is, it may not sound complimentary, but it's meant to be complimentary. Um, most contractors, most of the ones that I've dealt with and that that I've had the pleasure to come across and, you know, in working with, um, they are people pleasers. They want to make customers happy and they're humble guys. Now, I know the whole industry, you know, we get this, you know, rough and tough, you know, exterior, but most contractors deep down inside when you when you break break through all of the 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 calluses and the scars and the dust and they're, they're just big, soft teddy bears. And, and they're really, I think most contractors, really good ones are really humble. They don't need a lot of applause or accolades because they can stand back and look at something that they know that their hands built. Right. And they, they don't need a, but that all they get, all they need is that smile from the, the client's face. And they just go, yeah, we know that we know that it took years for us to get there. Here's the problem with that though is a lot of the guys in the trades and, and gals too, um, and people that have grown their, grown their businesses, they learned the construction part, the project part, the production part over years, and they had to stick with it. They had to have a passion for it because it sucks, it's hard, and, uh, and so you really got to have some grit to do that. And so when it comes to the business side of it, they – time has elapsed and they're older now they have more responsibilities they have families there's more you know weight on their shoulders or whatever and when it comes to the business side they go back to the building side and they say well i figured that out i can figure the business side out too there's just not enough time and it's a different skill set 
and guys and gals get into construction, especially out in the field, because they specifically don't want to be in the office. They mm-hmm. picked that that business, that trade, that, uh, that skill, because it puts them out with people working hard. And that's a, that's a great thing. And they think, well, I can figure out the business side of it too. Cause I figured out this really complicated thing on like how to, how to build stuff. Um, but it doesn't fall within their strengths. You know, I, so I think that that's, that's a big problem for a lot of, uh, you said, well, why are so many contractors like that? It's because they're good, hardworking, humble people that are self-taught, self-learners, and they are able to figure a lot of stuff out. Unfortunately, the business side is a different animal. And when they get to the business side of it, it's usually after 10 years, 15 years, you know, we all have, you know, we all get older, we have responsibilities, we have families, we have, there's no time to start over and you don't learn the business side of it. Um, You don't have time to learn it because money's at stake. Mm-hmm. Well, Sean, the, the biggest, I think, objection that I hear is I didn't go to college for business management. I don't know how to do this stuff, Sean. It's like, what are some top ways where contractors can actually go out? And I mean, obviously getting connected with you is a, is a great uh, way to kind of be a catalyst for this. But for those guys or gals that are out there and saying like, I didn't go to college for this stuff. What would you advise them to do? Yeah, go talk to somebody that did go to college for business and see if they can make you money. They can't. Like business school, business school doesn't teach you how to actually make money. Like when you get down to it, any business, but specifically we'll talk about contractors, like your job, any business owner, you have to make money appear out of thin air. They don't teach that in college. They teach like, hey, here's some best practices and here's what you should do with money and all of that kind of stuff. So if if that is like a we were talking about a mindset thing, like, oh, I didn't go to college for this. So therefore, I'm I I don't have the skills. Yeah. If you can read a tape measure, that's all that's all you need to be able to like you already know the math of your uh, of the business. Right. You just have to apply it in in a different way. Uh, Like I always say, like, hey, I'm not a CPA. I don't have an MBA. And I can't read a cash flow statement, but I wrote a financial book that's changed a lot of contractors' lives. Because we you you boil it down to the basics, right? And so when people say, "Oh, well, I didn't go to college for this," so neither neither did most people that are successful Mm -hmm. in doing what they're doing. Yes, I mean college is helpful in certain areas, but most business owners just go talk to enough of them, especially the ones that are really really successful. None of them followed a linear path. They mm-hmm. followed linear a, does not exist. No, it does not ex- <laughs> not not exist at all. But and I think you know Steve Jobs said this. You know, looking back, you can connect the dots, right? Yep. So don't yep. let don't let lack of experience or lack of education or something else. It's all figure outable. Like mm-hmm. in the 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 age that we're living in with with social media and YouTube, you're just I mean you're a couple of DMs away from somebody that's doing something amazing that did not start out doing that thing. Yeah. And they stumbled their way through and saying like, well, I didn't learn the business side of it. We have me either. You just figure it out. Uh, I've, I've, I've said this so often, the best master's degree is actually just starting a business. You're not going to realize they're not going to teach you about getting punched in the face. No, I mean, that's where, that's the, where the real learning lessons come in. And then you iterate on that. Yeah, I've I told a lot of people like, hey, when you come into a coaching program, and this just gets into the, you know our philosophy. I can on day one, I could be like, all right, do this, do this, do this, do this, and do this. But you you're not able to absorb it. Like that's what you should that's what you should do. Uh, but you've got to you you've got to walk them through and show build layer after layer, foundational layer after foundational layer, just like you would build a house, right? And say like, we'll we'll get to the pinnacle, we'll get to the top. But none of it matters if we skip these uh, we skip these basic foundational things. And when I'm working mm-hmm. with contractors, that's what we try to do is just to say, hey, most problems that you have in your construction business are because not because of something complex that you haven't figured out. There's not some fast, you know, some some fast way there or some button that you get. There's not a tip, a trick yeah. or a hack. Yeah. The problems you're having, it goes back to some basic foundational thing in business marketing, sales, tracking systems, and dealing with people. 
Like those are some basic things. Communication. If we can get those things in, in place, then you can move. As we, we always say, uh, we, we want to help provide people with fast forward buttons. Most business owners, mm -hmm. when they get desperate, they're looking for the shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And so we'd say, hey, we don't do shortcuts here because shortcuts skip steps. When you skip steps, you develop gaps in your business. Mm -hmm. Right. It may feel good, but we want to provide fast forward buttons saying that obstacle that's in your way, let's get you through it faster so you can be further faster than skipping trying to go around it because yeah. the, the you know um solving problems and dealing with obstacles leads to growth mm -hmm. shortcuts lead to gaps which leads to chaos and that's what a lot of clients we we just take them back to like all the time that you know we'll have the conversation around the numbers hey we're doing pretty good we're doing several million dollars we got a team of 10 or 15 people or whatever I'm like all right cool um are you profitable uh, yeah, I think so. And then I say, can you prove it? Uh, and then they don't know. And I'm like, Hey, mm -hmm. if you own a business, whether you're just starting out or you're years in business and you're hearing this podcast or whatever, I want you to think about that. You own a business. You are responsible for yourself, your family, your team. And I think you're responsible to the community, like being an entrepreneur and owning a business, you should have, you should feel some weight of of making an impact in your community, however big or small that is. And when someone asks you, can you prove whether you're profitable? The answer needs to be, well, you know, profits were down in the first quarter, but we're seeing a slight uptick in the second quarter. We've got a plan in place. We've got to switch some personnel out, but we're trying to do X, Y, and Z so that our third quarter numbers are a little bit different, you know, can be trending in the right thing. But we've also seen that this is kind of part of the cycle of our business uh, in these curtain marking conditions, like that's rather, what a business owner talks just about. Saying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know, and I'm, but I'm saying you're if you're hearing that and you're like, I don't know any of that. It's okay. You're not yeah. alone. That's the other thing. A lot, a lot of business yeah. owners are just saying like, Hey, man, I've screwed something up. I'm not doing it. And then they go to social media and they see all these guys and gals and they're posting all of this stuff. And I just tell them like, I don't, you know, we'll just put this out there. Hey, they're not making money either. If they are, sometimes I say, you don't want their marriages. You don't want their families. You don't want that type of relationship with your kids. You, you're you just seeing the eye candy that they put yep. out there. But I'm telling you, profitable business owners, you when you know what to look for, there's a different, there's a different look, there's a different feel, um, and they're confident. When I talk to them, I'm like, hey, are you profitable? Can you prove it? Yeah, I, I got my report from my CPA. Numbers are a little bit down. Like they they go straight to the information, the data that they know. So if if you're worried that like you don't know that, it's okay. Everybody, most contractors are like that. Um, but but there's an opportunity to be different, and different isn't that difficult. It means like, hey, we need simple system in place, like tracking time. That's that's one thing, a very simple system, and that's going to influence the influence the numbers just getting a quarterly meeting with your cpa or your bookkeeper to say like hey i don't know all this number stuff can you dumb it down for me and give me the basics because i own this business and i'm ultimately responsible for it there's a way to educate yourself on that and it doesn't take years and years but it could take a few months of discipline and creating time to say like all right i need to know a little bit more about my business what are the numbers telling me and what systems do i need to influence the numbers Speaking on that, Sean, knowing a little bit more about your business, um, we've talked a little bit already on the podcast around pricing, cash flow, um, but the two other buckets that I've kind of seen from you is specialization of projects and people. And the two biggest things that I see, maybe we can talk on the people first, is I was talking to a business earlier this week and they're growing, they about 10x their top line revenue, which, you know, from the outside looks great. They've thrown more people at the uh I would say problem or fires, however you want yeah. to frame it. Um, but break that down for us. Is that the most common thing that you see with businesses is they're growing the top line revenue projects are coming in and they're like, Hey, we got a people problem. We need more people on this. Yeah. Well, I would say as you survive in business, hopefully going from surviving to thriving in business, there is a, there's a mindset shift that I think every business owner experiences. And you don't have to have this mindset shift, or I guess you say you're going to be faced with it. You might make this shift and go off and, and become the business owner that you should be. 
Um, or you got to bring somebody in to deal with that part of the business. And what I'm saying is if you're in business long enough and you realize it's not about the work, it's not about, uh, it's, it's not about the clients. It's not about, I mean, all of that stuff is important. It ultimately comes down to people. When you've got 10 people, 20 people, 30 people on your, like, you're, you're just thinking like at some point you got to get away from the work and it's got to be about people. You got to fall in love with people. And that's really hard to do, especially if you have a team of 20 or 30 people, you're going to have some people on your team that you don't love. Right. But you're going to have to serve them to say, man, this guy, this gal really hard to deal with. But I love people. That's what my job is now. The work we can get people to go do the work. But like I got to get I got to get focused on my on my people. So I got to go have a hard conversation with this guy to say, hey, man, you do great work here, um, but nobody likes to work with you. We got to change that. We want you to we want you to thrive here. How can I help you as a person? Um, Mm. And so. So on the people side, every business, I don't care, even on the tech side, eventually it's got to be about serving people. And Mm -hmm. if like, I'm a very direct person and my empathy, my, my, I have very little empathy. You can ask my kids about that. Um, But I've realized that I'm like, Hey, as our business grows here, I've got to make sure that I'm hiring people that aren't as direct as me. I can, I can deal with you know, being the direct person, I got to bring other people in here. Maybe they don't know much about construction, uh, but in order to serve our clients, I need somebody that be more empathetic, someone to speak into me to be like, hey, Sean, uh, you're really direct with this. Information's not wrong. The way you're presenting it is you need to soften this up a little bit. And I've realized like, hey, that's not my strength. People is not my my strength. So I got to bring other people in uh, for things that I'm not for things that I'm not good at. Um so that's what I always say is like, hey, if you don't, if you aren't finding yourself after years in business, falling in love with people, growing the business and owning the business, a true business owner is going to be really hard. Mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest transition of leadership too, is realizing that all your people, I mean, sure, they work for you, but you work for them. Yeah. We, we used to say when we were at the, when I was a CEO over the trim and millwork company that I talked about, we went from like six guys to over 20 guys in about 18 months. So really fast mm-hmm. growth. And we were just making stuff up, right? We were reading books on leadership and trying to, trying to, you know, stay ahead of these people. Uh, we had a, we had a great team and we certainly had our ups and downs. Uh, but we had a conversation one time where we finally uh, mapped out the organizational chart and said, okay, here's what this is. And I give all the, all the credit to, uh, to the owner of finish finish point for putting this thought in my head. And he just took the, you know, or, and he's a big people person and I'm a big systems person. Um, and he took that organizational chart and he said, I like it. Uh, I get it. And I see the need for it. He's like, but this is the way I want to look at it. And he flipped it upside down. And he said, said, we're at the bottom and everybody that's above us, all, you know, from directors and managers all the way to the, like the apprentices, the lowest guys on the totem pole, they're at the highest part in our organization. We're here to serve them. And I, that was really impactful for me as a business leader to say like, yeah, you got to lay out the organization from the CEO and, and how all the roles and all that kind of stuff work. And then when you get that, turn it upside down and say, there's the job. These people are not supporting me as a leader anyway, I'm supporting them. That makes a lot of sense. Sean, I want to switch gears a little bit, um, talk about a couple more topics before we kind of wrap up. Um, One thing that's been very drilled into my head following all of your stuff for the last couple of years is you need to stop selling price, sell value. How do you communicate value? Well, uh, value is, uh, price is just what you, and I'll steal this from Warren Buffett. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. People buy based on emotion and it, some people will take this as like, oh, it's manipulative. And, and I know that you had uh, Tom Reber on uh, a little while ago, and he's great at this too, saying like, hey, let's just get, let's get to the emotional part of it. Um, and because that's where people are going to make those decisions. And so the value really comes in. I can, I mean, think about, you know, hey, I, I need a car, right? And if I, if I walk onto a Honda or if I walk onto the Mercedes lot and be like, yeah, I just want four wheels and a, uh, and a way to get from point A to point B, they're going to be like, well, our minimum thing to solve that problem is like a $65,000. Oh, I don't, I don't want that. Yeah. Cause you don't appreciate the value that comes along with the Mercedes. You need to go down to the 
Honda dealership, the used car or whatever, they can hook you up and you can get some value there for what you're willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. But here, when you pay this price, you get a certain level of value. And so the value part of it is just what, what is the benefit that, that the customer is going to get? And um, there is, I'm not going to say infinite, but there's a really big gap that when you can figure out what it costs you to produce something versus the value the customer is going to get, then your price gets to go way up. Hey, we're, you know, we're, we're building a house of, you know, X, Y, and Z and all you get all of the specs and then say, okay, great. Um, do you want to, you know, do you value communication? Do you value security? Do you, do you value, do you value um, employees? Uh, you know, meaning we have in-house employees or we subcontract, whatever the value is for the customer, the more that you can say, yeah, this is the value that we deliver to you um, and show them that like the value you're going to get is 10 X. We only are charging, you know, we're twice what the other guys are, but what you get with us is way more than you can get with them because of the experience. It's all about mm -hmm. the experience. And we all buy products and services based on how it's going to benefit us. And a lot of contractors just, again, back they're, they're so familiar. Well, we can do this and we're awesome at this and look at this project. See, that's all about me. That's all about me. That's all about me. I want to get into it with the customer and say, what do you value, right? Mm -hmm. What What is important to you? What are you fearful of? And solve those problems. And if I can solve those problems, then the value goes up. And then my price just needs to be, you know, in, in line with the value, meaning like, hey, it doesn't, if I'd always even tell my, my clients, this is like, Hey, you got to buy one of our coaching programs. It's, it's not low dollar. Um, but if someone's, you know, I don't know, spends $3,000 with us and they say like, Oh yeah, I got $3,000 in value out of it. Well, I'm thinking like, crap, we failed. Like that's a one-to-one. -one. I want you to spend $3,000 and I want to show you how you can get $30,000 in three months. Cause then you can repeat that. And then we drop into, Hey, if you've got this problem, you can do this. Like, here's what you're going to benefit from this system or whatever. And, and put that value out there and say, Hey, is that the kind of value you want? Yeah. All right. All you got to do is pay our price, get out of the way and we're going to deliver this value. So the, but you can't sell value if you're not confident in the benefits or the results that some, that you're going to be able to give somebody and people are going to want to, they're going to want evidence of that, but it's pretty simple. We got some testimonials, We've got some other other things that we can put in front of you very quickly to show you the value that we're talking about. We've done it before. Mm -hmm. So you're not so much upselling the product that you're putting out, more or less the experience that you're giving them. It's all about it's all about, and especially in construction, it's all about experience. And especially nowadays with what the industry is is seeing, it's all about communication. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, I know that we priced this project a few months ago, and the lumber package was a hundred thousand dollars. Yep. Man, and this goes back to the people pleasing thing. We just found out it's 125. Well, let's see if we can save the client some money. We'll do some other way. We'll eat the cost. I don't know because I don't want to have that difficult conversation because it won't please them. But the business owner that can say like, "Hey, yeah, this is this is not this is not fun for me to have, but here we can show you it was a hundred thousand dollars lumber package two months ago, and now it's 125. And it's totally outside of our control." I know, I know that that's difficult and we might need to cut back on something else, but that's just the, that's the reality of, of, of where it is. That level of communication is as difficult as that individual conversation may be. At the end of that, someone says, you know, man, building our house right now was really hard. There were so many changes in the, you know, supply chain issues and all that, but our contractor always let us know. He always was ahead of the game and we had to, we didn't get everything that we want that we thought it would, but we realized it wasn't his fault because there was, there was tracking. They were showing us, they were staying ahead of the yeah. game. And so mm -hmm. we ended up spending 20% more, but we are very confident in the, in the experience that the contractor gave us. And we would recommend them every time. That makes sense. You're providing a, a, a better a better experience and overall that's what that's what sells that that makes a lot of sense yeah i'm i'm curious if there was one thing someone could take away from this episode and begin executing like not a month out not a year out literally tomorrow what piece of advice would that be 
Well, I'll go back to the I'll go back to the profit first for contractor stuff. And I know that it sounds like salesy stuff, snake oil and all this kind of stuff. But part of our marketing around that, you know, in in the profit first for contractor stuff is saying our system will make you permanently profitable. You don't have to have your books in order uh, or you don't have to crunch any numbers in order for this to work. So this is always a piece of advice that I get is take whatever your bank balance is right now, whether it's a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. And go take 1% of that and go stick it into another bank account called profit and don't touch it. It will be there at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year. And for some contractors hearing this, if they'll go do that simple step, just go, to, that's it. Go create an account. You can probably do this online, transfer 1% um, and don't touch it. It will, it will be there no matter what the profit and loss st statement says, what your bookkeeper says or whatever, you know, that money is over there. <clears throat> And then going forward, so do this tomorrow. We always call this the day one. Day one, move 1%. And you're not going to miss it. <clears throat> it's only 1%, right? And now going forward, day two to day 365, every dollar that comes into the business on a regular frequency, go put 1% over there and forget about it. And if you don't touch it, you will have more money in profits because you're not going to miss it. It's only 1%. So that's what I always tell people. It's the way... <clears throat> the way that you make money in construction has more to do with the way that you behave with money than the actual math of it. Hey, that 1%, if you keep it in one bank account, you're just going to spend it. Go set it aside. Yeah. Don't touch it. It's going to be there. And then when you realize like, oh, yeah, that actually don't really miss that 1%, then start bump it up to 2% and do that. And then bump it up to 3%. Eventually, you're going to find where you actually are in profits without uh, without a bookkeeper, without a financial statement. And you say, oh, man, it's a little bit more difficult to like put 3% of every dollar over into that bank account because like I don't have enough money to pay my bills. Okay, great. We've just identified exactly how profitable you are in the simple system and you haven't crunched any numbers. And uh, So that's what I always steps. tell people. Yeah, it just it's it's baby steps. And that's the other thing is, you know, we're like Breck said at the beginning, I'm a nerd for systems. A lot of problem that we see when or this is a hurdle that a lot of people have to get over when we say, OK, we got a system for this. We got a system for that. Or I want to get this system in place. And it's not a bad thing. They always go to the outcome of the system. I need this system so that I can get this. But there's all of these steps in the way. So I got to work and putting this system in place before I can execute on it. And the most important part is installing any system. Sure, we want to know what the outcome is, the why, where we're going, right? But that's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. The most important part of starting any system is step one. You can't get to the end step if you don't do step one. And step one is usually so simple and so basic. Like, hey, we need to have a job costing system that's going to require spreadsheets and an accountant or a bookkeeper or an admin and all this kind of stuff. Okay, great tomorrow when or monday morning when you hit the job site how many man hours are in that task that you have that's the start of a job costing system you don't have to create a document you know, just take a minute and say like i got four guys out here and this should take about you know 40 man hours 10 hours or whatever write that down and then just see did we did we get it done and do that again and again, task after task. And after a while, you'll start to build up this job costing system, whatever the system is, determine the outcome, understand why it's important, and then figure out what's step one, because that's the most important thing to execution is step one. Most people sit there mm -hmm. to say, well, someday, someday yep. I'll get this system built. And if you just start stringing a series of step ones together, then you can bring people in and be like, hey, that system over there, we've got step one, step two, and step three, but step four through 10 is beyond my skill set or whatever. That's what you're working on. This one, these other systems, we've only done step one. So I need you to go and execute on the rest of the stuff. And you hire people that can come in and be like, oh, that system? Yeah. No problem. That's that's what I did at my last job. Be happy to do that. And in a week or a month or three months, it's like you have all these systems built out. But contractors, again, back to what we were saying before, they're like, I can go build this or I have to be the one that builds this because I don't have anybody else. No, you just you get the system. You understand the outcome. Do step one and then go find somebody that has experience building out that system.
that makes I, perfect I, sense. I like I like the baby step aspect to it too, because oftentimes it seems like it's just so far away. It seems like there's so many things that you need to implement. Like you just need to turn this business upside down and shake all the bad shit out and just redo the whole thing. And that that's what is scary, I think, for a lot of people is not realizing that there's little things that you can do. And I I forget where I read it at. It was in a book somewhere, but getting 1% better every day mm -hmm. overall leads to massive growth over time. And I love that. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's kind of what you're, you're getting at here is that it, it doesn't have to be done overnight. It can be systems implemented over the course of six to a year even. And I, I, I like that. Yeah. And you talk to anybody that's had any level of success. Sure. There's those, the outliers there that, that they got lucky, right place, right time yeah. or whatever. But most people, you know, in, I don't know where I heard this, but it's just like, oh yeah, when you when you look at somebody that's an overnight success, it took 20 years to get there or whatever, right? Yep. It's, just, it's, just, it's just consistency and discipline when no one else is looking and when no yep. one's patting you on the back, when you're losing your ass on every job, but you're just like, all right, we but we can make this better. What's the next little thing? And it's like, oh, that little thing sucked. It actually made things work. So you step back. It's just, but just constantly tweaking and testing. And then people come to you and say, hey, Matt, how did, how did you do, how did you get to be here? And you're just like, oh man, 15 years of constant failure, uh, but just small improvements over time. One of the things that I always teach my employees is, is we say, hey, if we're, if we're um, not making mistakes, we're not pushing hard enough. If we're mm -hmm. making repeated mistakes, we're not paying attention. So yeah, yeah, it's I both like of those. Hey, reminder. where are we pushing? Oh, oh we, we screwed this up. We made a mistake because we didn't know what we were doing and we were making it up. All right, let's not repeat it. Repeated mistakes, no. But little mistakes that are pushing the, you know, pushing the meter forward, yeah, let's make a lot of those because most people stop after the first one. Yep. I love the way you put that. I love how much you simplify stuff too. Well, that's my job, man. That's my job. Um, I got, like Sean, I said, I got five kids to feed, so we got to make gotta it really simple. Things. Yeah. You got a little basketball team over there. That's right. Uh, Sean, before we uh, get into some of the uh, the fast five, what what's new for you? What do you got going on? Anything that uh, people should be looking forward to over the next few months from you? Yeah, we're really excited. We got a couple of things coming up. One is we're uh, now that uh, I guess we can kind of say we're post pandemic or whatever. Um, we're back to doing live events. So before the uh, before the pandemic, we we were putting on our own events around the country. So we're back to doing that. We've got one coming up in Austin, Texas at the end of October, October 20, uh, 27th and 28th. And uh, we're creating an operational blueprint for construction business owners. So really excited about getting uh, getting contractors together. Small event, uh, only 30 spots, about half of those spots are gone. So that's gonna be coming up. You can find some more information at uh, builttobuildacademy.com slash live if you wanna join us in Austin, Texas. And we got really awesome uh, custom home builder, uh, Ryan Hay with Oakman Building, uh, building company. He's been on Matt Reisinger's show before, and uh, we're going to end that event at touring one of his custom home sites there in, in Austin, Texas. So that's coming up. And then also in October, we are doing our, uh, we're calling it a, internally here, we call it a revamp of the Built to Build Academy. So that's our uh, business and uh, operational systems coaching program. Uh, so we've got, we're revamping that streamlining. We've, tw we've tested it. Like I've just talked about, we've made 1% uh, improvements upon that. And so we're starting to bring all that together and we're going to be launching that uh, in October as well. So people can check that out at uh, built to build Like I said, we're, we're, we haven't launched it yet, but uh, we'll, we'll be in, as we get into September, we'll be we'll be piecing that out and uh, building the wait list and getting people onboarded. And so we're really, really excited about that. Awesome. One thing that we'll also do is uh, in the description, we'll post a link to all the events for if you guys can make it to the Austin one in October, late October, or even future ones, we'll drop that link below so you can stay in, in, in the loop. Um, but the one thing that I did want to say, I want to remind you guys, if you've made it this far, you're definitely serious about growth in your business. So I appreciate you listening. Uh, maybe about an hour in. Um, as a reminder, we are offering a 50% off consultation with Sean. Again, this is a $500 value. You're going to get it for about 250 bucks, but you got to have some skin in the game. Sean, I'll let you do the justice this time, but what does an hour consultation look like for you? 
Yeah. So a lot you. of times what, you know, we, we want to make sure that we can hit the ground running in this consultation. So um, we're going to, we're going to support you a lot before you show up. So uh, we're going to ask you some questions and, and get some information so we can hit the ground running. But what that hour long thing is, is I think getting, getting some clarity, obviously on some tactical nerdy stuff on the business systems, but also just getting, uh, getting some advice on, what the next, you know, what the next steps are for, for your business. Um, and whatever, whatever that is, uh, we spend about an hour or so together. It'll be recorded. We're going to cover a lot of information. You're not going to be able to absorb all of it. So don't worry. That's why we record it. We'll send you a recording uh, of that afterwards. And, uh, and so, yeah, we just, we try to get to the nuts and bolts uh, pretty quickly and solve some problems uh, that may be, you know, standing in your way right now. And what we say is like you said before, it's tactical advice to solve problems that you're facing today. Hey, I know we got two year, five year, 10 year goals. The things that we're going to talk about are those little 1% things that you can do right now, very executable uh, sort of stuff. And I love, I love to do those. Some people aren't, you know, they aren't ready for a coaching program uh, for what, for whatever reason. So we offer these consults just to help the industry out to say, Hey, here's some things that you need to be putting in place in a, in, in a very uh, quick fashion so that you can get results really fast. Yeah. And that diagnosis is very helpful to see where you stand in the business. So if you're interested and you're serious about it, go to the description in this podcast, click on the link. We'll drop it there. Um, like what Sean said, you'll share a little bit more about where you're at in the business, the challenges that you're facing, and then we'll be picking one of those businesses to move forward uh, with the consultation with Sean. Um, Sean, before the end of every episode, we wrap up with our fast five questions. Five questions to be answered in a sentence or less. Oh, Number man. One. And I knew this was coming. I did, you know, like I said, I did jujitsu earlier today. I'm more <laughs> nervous about the fast five than I was about the guys that were going to beat me up today. As so you I was like, should all right. Be. As we, you should be. we don't tell anybody these ones. Uh, we don't, no, okay. we don't beat we. you up physically, just mentally. Yeah, yep, just yep. mentally. Yeah, that's if what I'm If you were a of. worm, right. how long would you be? <laughs> We've had some crazy ones on here. Um, all right, five questions to be answered in a sentence or less. Number one, your favorite thing about Knoxville would be? Uh, fly fishing. Boom. Two, what's a TV show you could see yourself being on? Oh, man, what a great one. Probably, this will tell my age a little bit, but uh, I would say Seinfeld. Ooh, that's a good one. Number three. What's one thing pe most people don't know about you? Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout. <laughs> I've really? seen that picture. It's, it's great. Handsome young yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. Number four, your one message to the next generation would be? Um, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, forget passion. Passion is almost worthless, but building skills that are rare and valuable will get you to your dream job faster. And I stole that from Cal Newport's book. So, so good. They can't ignore you. So if you're offended by that, go read that book. It's awesome. I definitely think I'll, I'll interject right there. I think uh, passion definitely follows competency. Uh, five, what does the phrase bread to build mean to you? I think I'm, I knew that this might be a question, so I'll try to keep it short. We talked about that, uh, that fork in the road. And it's okay if you get to that fork in the road and you're bred to build, meaning that you want to build the projects, you want to be out in the field, you want to produce the work. That's that's awesome. Go make a great living for yourself, but but don't kid yourself that that is not owning a business. And owning a business is about growing people, about growing systems, and I think ultimately having an impact on your community. And there's whichever fork you take some people say like oh well you know just earning the living no we need more people making a really good living um and we need people that are are true business owners where everything doesn't depend on them so i think for me bread to build is that intersection at that fork in the road and making that decision and being very comfortable in it and saying nope i want i'm bread to build projects Great. Go and go and do that. Make a great living for yourself and show the world what it looks like uh, to be a skilled tradesperson and the awesome life that can come with that. Or I'm bred to build this as a business. I'm mm -hmm. going to uh, put the ego aside in the past 15, 20 years of building stuff. And I'm going to go build a business that's based on people and uh, and and results for others. 
you know, I'm sure you offend quite a few people. The more I, the more I hear you talk about like ditch, ditching the whole, I've heard so many people tell me that they just, they enjoy building so much. That's why they do it. But at the end of the day, and that they'll say that because oftentimes it's about money. Um, we're all here to make money. That's the bottom line. And how you get to that point is obviously different for everybody, but there's so many people that say that they're in it just because they love building. Well, if you, if you're really into it like that, I mean, Breck, do you remember uh, Jared that we had on? Yep. He's in Mexico right now, building for families down there on a mission, love the kid to death. That's passion. That that's mm -hmm. loving building. If you're just building for clients though, you don't, you don't really like building. You're getting a paycheck at the end of the day. So there's a business aspect to it. I think a lot of people don't do good in business, but then counter that with, well, I, I love what I do. And I think that's where it goes south for a lot of people. I've caught myself doing that. Yeah, and I, I, I don't discount that at all. That's just why I, I tell people like, hey, you're going to face this decision. You're going to face this fork in the road. And the clearer that you can get on that and saying like, no, I want to go be the builder and have my hands on the stuff. Great. That's awesome. Uh, or I want to, I want to go build a business. There's, there's just two different aspects uh, yeah, yeah. to that. And there's, there's nothing wrong with either one of them, For but sure. it's the person that doesn't land on clarity on that at that fork in the road of what they're doing is the one that complains is the yeah. one that gets burned out is the one that says, don't go into construction because they don't have clarity on why they why they're doing it and it's either about producing the work which is awesome or it's about caring for people and i'm not saying when you you know make a living or you're producing the work you don't care about people i'm just breaking it down to like that's the real differentiation john i really love what you you had mentioned in this podcast too and kind of my my biggest key takeaway is you know bread to build can mean anything to anyone. It's really how they choose to define it. But the one thing that I've heard from you today is build the foundation. You have a responsibility to uh, your people, your family, you, your community to lay that foundation, not only to be great at building projects, but to be great at building a business so that you can provide for the people that you care about. Yeah. I would also tell other people out there, you, you may find that you own a business and you're doing really well in business, but for whatever reason, I mean, business just sucks too. Business is hard, just like yeah. you, just producing the work is hard. And I, I realized this when I shut my business down and went to work uh, as the executive of that trim and mill work company, that was really hard. But I realized too, I could take my skills and my abilities. And once I got out of my own way saying, well, gosh, I'm now an employee, up, up until starting this this business, I look back on that time. That was my best work. The reason it was my best work is because I was there for a purpose to solve problems. I had an incredible team around me that I never had before by myself, not at, you know, at that scale. And I look back and say, man, if I had thought, well, I own a business, I'm a business owner, um, I would have missed that opportunity. And which again, looking back, led to this opportunity. So for a lot of guys out there, sometimes it's like, hey, Pat yourself on the back. You got a business, but it, if things change, you could be so impactful as an employee, whatever that looks like for another, you know, another business. And you get a lot of the weight of the business part lifted mm -hmm. off of your shoulders. So you get to just focus on what it is that, that you want to do. And we have so many people out there, so many contractors out there that need really great employees. So there's a huge opportunity to make a ton of money being a freaking awesome employee. Yep. Or being an entrepreneur. That's right. That exactly. Uh, Sean, Matt dropped a, a quote before we end this episode. Uh, one thing that I just want to bring up again, if you're not making mistakes, you're not doing enough. If you're making the same mistakes, you're not paying attention enough. Sean Van Dyke. That's a pretty, I'm gonna get that, I'm gonna pretty get awesome that tattooed. quote. There we go. I want to see it, Matt. Proof. Right, right across the old cheeks. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Well, Sean, thanks so much for joining us on the Bread to Build podcast. Before we let you off the hook, though, uh, where can people find and connect with you? Yeah, you can just uh, Google Sean Van Dyke, and that's S-H-A-W-N. Uh, hopefully, our SEO is working, so you'll find all of our stuff there. You can go to SeanVanDyke.com or uh, BuiltToBuildAcademy.com. And then follow awesome. me on Instagram at Sean Van Dyke. Sean puts out a ton of free, valuable content, whether it's his newsletter, blog, 
social media. Even I learn a lot. I, I'm not even running a construction business and I, <laughs> and I go through and I'm looking at all this stuff. I'm like, man, I can learn a hell of a lot from this guy. I have so definitely say, check your, it out. Your last couple Instagram posts have been awesome. I've, I was going to touch on it in the podcast, but um, it kind of got shifted down to the back end. But the the one to one to one, um, basically like the labor and material being what most people bid off of and not ever thinking about anything more. And that's something that took me a long time to figure out as well. But once you start, you realize that there's more to it than just labor and material. There's the back end and everything else that it takes to run your business. That is awesome. I love that. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing that. I, my team was like, whoa this one's really landing well. I'm like, well, there's this guy named Matt who has like a million followers and he shared it so that it, it, you know, that helped. Uh, But my team was like, Oh, Oh, this is, you know, we, well, we've been tweaking the content and trying to, you know, make it more engaging. And I think my team thought like, Oh, we nailed it. I'm like, well, you did, but also Matt shared it. And that has a lot to do with it. So thanks for that. Oh, of course. Uh, That that was something that took me a long time to figure out and I'm still figuring it out. So I'm watching, I'm learning from you. So thank you for it, man. No, I like it, Sean. If uh, if you're not going to put it out, someone else will. That's right. And I and I asked uh, Nick Schiffer from uh, NS Builders. I think it was at the Builder Show. I was asking him why he does all this stuff. He was like, "Well, if I don't put it out, someone else will." And so I think yeah. that's the biggest takeaway for construction businesses out there to put your message out there because if you don't, someone else will. Yep, that's right. Um, guys, thanks for listening to another episode of the Bread to Build podcast. If you enjoyed this episode or you learned a thing or two, share it with a friend. Uh, if you'd like to join us on the podcast or you have topics that we that you want us to touch on, like this one, um, feel free to send us a message on Instagram at Bread to Build Podcast. As always, you can find me on all platforms on the Hammer app at Brett Cohen, at We Are Hammer at Builders of Insta, all on IG. My Matt, TikTok take has been my, my TikTok has been blowing up recently. So go follow me over there. Um, really, <laughs> really proud of those numbers. We're cranking it. We've done a couple million views in the yeah. last day. There we um, go. Last video is me and Breck dancing. So go check that out. You could find me on all, all social platforms at Matt Bangswood. Um, and then surely a couple other places as well. Thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Bread to Build podcast. Until next time.